Last year, I attended a workshop in GGI, Italy. There, I was once I was chairing the talk. But at the time, I was told by organizers that I should wait at least five minutes. <laughs> so it was so nice that uh, many, many people don't come on time. So I hate initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's it things uh, more factual here. So okay, let's start our. <laughs> First talk of this week. So yeah, thank you very much for coming. Uh, <clears throat> last week we had a kind of uh, starting workshop, which was very dense. I hope I hope you enjoyed a lot. I, at least myself enjoyed a lot of the thoughts and so on. But uh, last week we were we have started to kind of create a bridge right, between the three fields, no equipment that make and uh, uh, active matter and more biological side. But I think uh, the bridges are still in you know, a fragile and smaller. And smaller. So, so this week we want to try to make you know, the bridges more broader or uh, solider and so on. And uh, to, for this purpose, uh, yeah, we try to have a few kind of pedagogical lecture lectures, especially from non Korean side. And uh, the first such lecture is by Hugo Koshete uh, from South Africa. And uh, yeah. As many of you probably know, he's a really leading expert on the subject. He wrote a very influential review paper and he planned to write a book like that. And uh, yeah, he's going to talk about some basic stuff and some application things and so on. So yeah, we are very happy to yeah, invite uh, Hugo for the lectures. Thank yeah, you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the plan is to give three lectures. Um, I have the first two planned, and then I'll take a survey on the second one on Wednesday to see um, what I should be covering, what you'd like me to cover. I hope by then we'll have enough material actually to make a choice. Before I start with the slides, then I just want to try to make a bridge with what we have seen last week and what I'll be talking about this week. And I think some of the talks also will be, will be having this week. Um, so last week we've seen lots of experiments, lots of movies and interesting physics and biophysics that needs to be modeled. And the starting point, I guess, which is not what I do, but what I can consider many people doing is that they have some data, they're doing some experiments. That's the real world side. And then you can come up with trajectories or, or high dimensional system. And then you have some, some trace and time for some system. Time and you want to model that that system. So that leads us to the second stage of the kind of scientific approach is to come up with a model of, of that system. And for me, for us, actually, we've seen this quite a lot last week. The model will be a stochastic model. So you consider some random variable that involves with time. And then of course, it's a it's a whole field in itself to come up with models and models that are good enough for describing what you want to describe in the real world. And we have the trade-off between being able to solve the model but capturing enough of the physics to, to do some kind of uh, meaningful prediction. What I'm interested in is not so much the model itself and how it evolves and how you do the model, but some other quantities that you might measure on, on, on the system. So something, especially that will be time integrated in time, and over some some observation time capital T, so it could be some observed. So we call this an observable of the system, and so this will depend on the whole trajectory of the system. And what I'm interested in is to calculate the distribution of this observable. So you have to imagine, you know, you have access to lots of trajectories. You can measure something like the energy exchange between the system and its environment. So this is something integrated in time. This is the observable. And then we want to calculate the distribution. The modeling is quite difficult. You can spend your whole life on this. It's quite interesting. And the definition of observable actually, I'll come to this more today, but even calculating a distribution is not so easy. But large deviation here actually is quite useful because in many cases, what you'll find is that this decays exponentially with the observation time. And then there's a certain exponent that will capture really most of the characteristics of the distribution. And then it's easier to get that function, which we call the rate function, than calculating the distribution itself. But this is an approximation. And then the goal actually more tomorrow, again, will be to explain what this approximation is 
and how we can get that rate function. The interesting thing in large deviation theory is that this kind of exponential approximation actually arises in other fields too, not just in this context of time dependent processes and then observable that you integrate in time, but also if you look at many particle systems, we can have a system of n particles, and then you look at that from an equilibrium point of view. So you define an ensemble like the canonical ensemble or the microcanonical ensemble, and then you look at so in this case, you have states like an n-particle state, and then you can also think about measuring some observable, which I'm going to write as m sub n for the n-particle. So it could be the magnetization or the energy of the n-particle system. And in this case, if you try to calculate the distribution of the, the macro state, the observable, what you find is that it's also exponential, but now with the number of particles. And this is what I want to cover today. And so this is quite interesting. You see this exponential arising in a totally different context. And then moreover, you can imagine another kind of experiment or another domain where you look at trajectories and then you look at trajectories that will be controlled by some small parameter like a small temperature or a small noise amplitude. And then you can try to look at the probability of the whole trajectory and then you see that the probability is also exponential, but now with the small parameter. So n here, number of particles, is a large parameter. T here is a large parameter. But in another field of application where you have a small parameter, you can also define probability distributions that will behave exponentially. And then in all cases, you have a certain rate function, i of something, that will tell you how the distribution behaves. So this is what I want to discuss in the three lectures. And then I was debating with myself last week what approach I should use to kind of introduce the subject. And then I have this talk, which is about the history of large deviation and how it started. And I think I'm gonna start with this because it's got a nice history and nice connections. And then it shows that the subject is quite old. In fact, you can trace it back to Boltzmann and it has different streams coming from physics and mathematics. And the relationship is quite interesting. And it's something that the connection was only discovered recently in the 80s and 90s. So I want to go through this. If you're working in large deviation theory, it might be interesting to see that the subject is quite old and has some nice roots to it. So this is the physics side of things. And this is the mathematics side of things. And then the goal today will be to go through this and then see how the subject just evolved from these two different streams and got merged or, or people realizing that there actually is a connection between maths and physics in the, the late 80s and 90s. So I'll cover mostly, so I'll cover a bit of history, go through the basics of large deviation, and I'll discuss today mostly equilibrium system. And the goal on Wednesday, not tomorrow, we're saying tomorrow, but the next lecture is actually on Wednesday, I'll cover Markov processes specifically. So this idea that you integrate some quantities and times over trajectories of a system. So today there will be no time, no dynamics. I'll consider equilibrium systems in terms of static and large deviations of, as a function of particle number. The things we'll see in that topic though will become, we'll see them again on Wednesday and also on Thursday. We'll be talking about typical states, fluctuations around typical states. We need many components of some kind of scaling limit. And then we'll see that we have concentration of probability because of the exponential form of distribution. And this connects to this idea of emergent determinism, which is the fundamental idea of statistical mechanics, the fact that you can start with a stochastic system at the bottom and then have that determinism emerging at the top in some scaling limit, could be a thermodynamic limit or hydrodynamic limit, and then we'll get to see this. So the material I'll discuss is in the review paper, which is, 2009 already. And the story starts with, with Boltzmann. This is considered actually the first large deviation calculation, even from mathematicians. Um, and this is a famous paper by Boltzmann. This is the paper that introduced the concept of entropy, 1877. So you might have seen this. It's quite likely that you've seen this calculation. If you haven't read the paper, I would really um, recommend reading the paper probably multiple times because it's not so easy to read Boltzmann. But the basic problem that Boltzmann was considering is the is calculating the entropy or 
developing a statistical mechanics approach for the ideal gas. So what you have is that you have n particles, and then you have to imagine that each of the particles can be in one of many energy level or discrete state. So there was no quantum mechanics at the time. So you have to imagine this is quite something actually in terms of description of a system. So each of the particles can be in a certain discrete state. What you want to consider and what Boltzmann did is not to consider the full microscopic description of the particles, but the macroscopic description in terms of the energy distribution. So you count the number of particles for each of the level J. So you're looking at a specific energy level or discrete state, and you say, how many particles do I have in that level? So this is the macro state. The main point that Boltzmann made in the paper, which is the main point that we know in statistical mechanics, is that you can have many different microscopic configuration leading to the same macro value, and this is the case here. If you know the energy distribution, you don't know in which state the system is, but this is the, this is the state that you'll observe at the macroscopic level, and the point is that you have many, many configurations that can give rise to the same microscopic value. Here, this will be a vector, so this is a distribution. You have a number for each energy level. So then Boltzmann goes into the thinking of how many such configuration then leads to uh, a given value of the energy distribution. For this, you have to do combinatorics. There's no interaction here, so it's just a counting exercise. And then the answer is with the multinomial factor. So you're looking at the number of ways you can actually assemble or distribute n particles according to that distribution, multinomial. Then you can use starting approximation to approximate the log of this. And then you get something that scales like the number of particles, which means in the end that the probability to see a given energy distribution will be exponentially small with the number of particles. And the little exponent that you have there when you do the calculation with Stirling approximation, you get the entropy. So the sum of P log P. In this case, it will be the sum of the distribution log distribution. You can normalize the distribution. It's not important for the result. And moreover, Boltzmann didn't really look at the probability. He looked at what was called at the time complexion. So the number, the density of state, the number of configuration that actually leads to a given energy distribution. So in this case, the number will be exponentially large with the number of particles with the same exponent, the entropy. You can retranslate this in terms of probability. So this is the result of Boltzmann here. The M is the entropy. You see that W, L, W, L is the log. Here you have the constraint, which is the number of particles, the number in the first energy state, second energy state. And so this is fixed to N. And L is the energy uh, constraint. If the energy is fixed, then you have that energy. And so you can look now at the most probable configuration or the most probable energy distribution. And so you would maximize the entropy subject to these constraints. And this is what Boltzmann does in the paper. So this is, this is a very important paper where the notion of entropy appears for the first time, but also the principle of maximum entropy also appears for the first time. And then the derivation leads to the most, the, the, what we call the Gibbs distribution now for the most probable distribution for fixed energy and fixed number of particles. But the interesting result for me for now is that exponential with the, uh, the number of particles, and then the approximation comes from Stirling approximation, which is not called Stirling approximation in Boltzmann paper. So this is the first result, 1877. That was done for the, the, the ideal gas, so no interaction. The next step in the story is Einstein reading Boltzmann and thinking, how can we generalize this to real system with interaction? We cannot do the counting. You cannot do combinatorics anymore because now you have interactions. And so if you fix the energy, it's, it's not possible to calculate the number of configurations that will have that fixed energy. Moreover, if you have now continuous degrees of freedom, you cannot do combinatorics. So how can we generalize this result? And Boltzmann takes kind of the reverse point of view is that we don't know how to calculate the number of configuration with a given constraint, but we know how to measure entropy. So we'll actually put this as a principle that the number of microstates, so the complexion, will always be given as the exponential of the entropy, the physical entropy. And this is Einstein's postulate. It means that, and this should be true for any kind of observable system that you can imagine or observe. So you imagine calculating the number of microscopic configurations that lead to a given value of a macro state. 
regardless of what the macro state you, you, you consider. So what, Boltzmann, uh, what Einstein does in the paper is, is show that if you take this as a postulate, you can basically rederive the whole of thermodynamics and much of statistical mechanics. In particular, if you look at the probability for the different values of the macro state, then you see that the one the equilibrium macro state will be the one maximizing the entropy, which was, was known already at the time. And moreover, if you do a perturbation, a quadratic expansion of the entropy around that equilibrium state, you can recover connections with heat capacity and, and, and various quantities that are measurable. So this seems like a good starting. And this is the result there. You see the number of configurations of the complexion is a constant times the exponential of the entropy. Of course, you can always write a quantity as the exponential of something. The main point is that is the extensivity of the entropy that should give rise to that n factor in the exponential. So this is now elevated as a general principle, but there's no underlying derivation here. It's more like a physical principle. You can measure the entropy. Let's assume that the complexion is the exponential of that entropy. It's very phenomenological. Uh, approach to this. So at that point, statistical mechanics is quite established or becomes more established. The principles are laid down, including this one. And then the rest for us is history. We know how that, uh, that, 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 that theory actually evolved to predict phase transitions and so on. And then it's been a very uh, busy enterprise. The starting point of the math side is slightly different. And this is now I'm jumping on the second strand. It's work by Harald Klammer, um, so a Swedish mathematician, who is very much interested in insurance mathematics. And the, the, the big subject at the time was the central limit theorem and calculating the distributions of sums of random variables. And then they considered for a long time sums of independent random variables because you can do calculations. So you have, what you, you have a sum of random variables here, they're independent, they have the same distribution. And then you divide by n, so this kind of a simple mean. And then from an insurance point of view, this is the number of random claims that you get from clients. So you're interested in calculating the distribution of this quantity because you want to calculate your risk as a company to have to give that much money over time. If you do a central limit approximation, you get a Gaussian approximation, which was known already at the time to underestimate the probability and details. So for a company, a Gaussian approximation is not good. You want to go beyond this. And Kramer was the first to actually go beyond the central limit, central limit theorem to calculate the distribution of that sum in an Algaussian way. And so what he showed is that everything actually follows from the, the cumulant. So if you know the distribution of the random variables in the sum, you can calculate the cumulant. And then the distribution, the dominant order, will decay exponentially with the number of random variables there with some function i of s. And then moreover, it was able to calculate all the corrections, but the corrections are subdominant with the exponential. So you start with one over square root of n there, and that's subdominant with the exponential. And the exponent, the rate function, is the Legendre transform of the cumulant. And this is something I'll come up uh, again in, in the talk, but also on Wednesday. This is really, really important. This is an interesting paper. It's a paper written in French. I took some time at some point to translate that paper. So it's on the archive in English. You have the result here. It's a paper that stayed on the shelf for quite some time for different historical reasons. That's not so clear to me. So it took a long time before people came back on that result. But that's really from the math side, from the pure math side, that's really the founding result in our observation. The next one actually took some time. And then the last one I'll discuss is a result by a Russian mathematician, Sano. 1957, and this one is quite interesting. So Sanov was looking also at independent random variables. So you have a sequence of random variables with the same distribution. As an example, it helps actually to think of this as a kind of uh, uh, um, just like zeros and ones. So you have a, a string of, of, of bits there. And then you want to look at the number. So you just throw a given sequence at random according to some probability. And then you count the number of zeros, the zeros and the number of ones. And then you divide by n. So you have the fractions of zeros and the fractions of ones. <clears throat> it's very similar to actually what Boltzmann did. And then you look at the distribution now of that quantity. That quantity is a vector now. It's a random vector. If you look at zeros and ones, you have two components, the number of zeros and number of ones. So it's a vector of two components. What's the distribution of this? It's the binomial distribution. If you have more states, it's the multinomial distribution. 
then you can approximate the multinomial using Stirling approximation. And what you find is that the probability for the whole vector, the random vector, goes exponentially with the number of random variables. And there's a small exponent that describes what's the decay. And then for that particular case, it's the relative entropy. So this is the result here. Actually, this one has been translated to English. Um, so you can find it in Russian and English. You see the relative entropy appearing there. And then there's a discussion of what's the most probable uh, value of the distribution that's going to happen if you fix the sum. And then it's also the kind of maximum entropy principle. In this case, it's a minimum relative entropy principle. And then Sandler also describes the fact that when n goes to infinity, the most likely distribution that you'll see is the one that has p as a distribution, right? Which makes sense. If you throw bits with probability one half, one half, then the most likely sequences are the ones with more or less half of zeros and half of ones. What this result says is that the sequences in which you have more zeros than ones are just exponentially unlikely. Okay? And this will be given exactly by putting your given fractions of zeros and ones in the relative entropy to get the exact number that will tell you exactly how unlikely it is on the exponential step. So that's the third result. From a physicist, this is an amazing result because it's exactly Boltzmann result. In fact, when you read this paper, it's kind of surreal because he starts with a discrete case and then uses Stirling approximation in the same way that Boltzmann did. But this is 1957, whereas we had 1877. So there's quite some years in between. And then what's, what's also interesting is that in, in Sanoff's paper, he does a discrete case first. And then he says, OK, how can we use this for continuous random variables? Well, we discretize them, and then we, can, we take a continuum limit. And you go back to Boltzmann, and it does exactly the same. The discrete model for the ideal gas is just convenience for doing the combinatorics. But in Boltzmann paper, the last part, which is quite long, is all about taking the continuum limit to take the discrete entropy to continuum, continuous entropy. And then you have the same here. But no mention of Boltzmann there. And the connection is, is something I, I, I try to actually study for quite some time, because Another thing bizarre with this paper is that this is the only probability theory paper of Sanov. Sanov was someone who was working in number theory, not in probability theory. And then he worked on that paper while he was um, in Moscow for some time. The claim to fame of Sanov, in fact, is that he was sent to North Korea for developing a math school there at the time in the, in the 50s. Um, so he doesn't have a very productive production for probability. And that's the only paper. And this paper is very very important in information theory. So there might be a connection with Boltzmann. It might via Kolmogorov, who probably was aware of Boltzmann, but there's no mention of this in the paper. OK, so that, that these are the starting jumps, if you want, of large deviation. Then it, it stayed quiet for a very, very long time after. And the topic really emerged again, let's say, at the end of the 70s and 80s. And I'll discuss this later. What's is clear here is that you have many situations of problems where you have a probability involving many components and the probability is exponential with that number of components. In physics, I don't think that Einstein actually thought about the exponential form of probability as something mathematical. It was more like a physical principle, whereas on the math side, nobody thought that this could be applied in, math, in physics or it had any application beyond uh, the, the, the problems that came from maths. But there's something there. Yes. So there works. So Yes, it's much before. So yes, like 1938 and 1957. But Sanov does not even cite Kramer, although you can derive Sanov from Kramer and the other way around too. They're actually connected because they're about independent random variables, but there were very few connections at the time. So it's like very sparse field. So the full connection in maths came in the, in the 70s, 80s from work by and Barada, and I'll discuss that later. But what I want to do now is just to lay down really the general principles of the theory. So the basic idea is that this exponential distribution or this exponential form of distribution is not an accident. It's quite general that it arises in many cases, including in physics, and then we'll get to see this. So we should start, we should, we should build a theory on this. So the theory will look at random variables that are indexed by something. I'm going to call this small n. It can be the number of random variables in the sum. It could be the number of particles in the system. It could be the integration time, like I'll be talking later on. It's a parameter. So you have a family of random variables 
index with some parameter. And then at some point you'll take a limit, but the exact nature of that parameter is up to you, depending on which application you're connected. So the goal of course, is to get the probability distribution of that memory variable. Yeah. So we are talking about N. Yeah, yeah. I'm using N. How large it should be yeah. always, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you already mentioned that uh, Einstein was on some formula, which is uh, N is like this mark or something. Yeah. He mentioned something about size of n. Or we'll get to this because it's an approximation. So we're going to have to discuss at some point what do we mean with the approximation and how good the approximation is. Okay. Yeah. But n at this point, um, now let's take a mathematical point of view. n is just the index for the, the random variable, and then it will be an n infinity. But the exact nature of n is, is up to us. In fact, the exact nature of the random variable now is not even specified. It could be a product of random variable. It could be a sum of random variable. It could be something else. And then we'll, this week, we'll get to define very different types of random variable, but still see that the distribution behave in an exponential way. Okay, so the idea is that we're expecting that will be an exponential decay for the distribution. So we elevate this as a principle. Uh, it's, it's got different names. So in math, it's called the large deviation principle. So whenever the distribution decays exponentially with n, we're gonna call this a large deviation principle. Here I'm stretching the notation. Um, I'm using capital P to imply that I have the probability, but it could be the probability density. So if you're dealing with a discrete random variable, you'll have a probability distribution. If you have a continuous random variable, you'll have a density. Of course, in maths, you don't even consider that densities exist. So you're gonna use a different kind of notation to take care of that. But here, I'm just gonna make things simple and then use that P there for the probability. And we, then we could specify, we could precise this in, with different levels of rigor if you want. Okay, so now what's the meaning of the approximation? So we want to convey is that this is the dominant part of the distribution. So if I take the log, then I should have something that's linear with that parameter with corrections that are sublinear. So that's the small O of N. And one way to get rid of that correction is, well, let's divide both sides by N and let's take the limit. Then what should remain is the rate function I of A. So this is the meaning. The distribution will be said to have a large deviation principle or will comply with the large deviation approximation if the limit here exists and gives you a function which is not trivial. So not everywhere at zero or not everywhere at infinity. And maths is defined in a more complicated way, of course, because limits don't necessarily exist. So it will be a lim soup, there will be a lim inf, and in many cases the two limits will be the same. So the limit exists. And in physics, we put this under the rug. And then we just take the limit. So this is what I'll do. So what this defines is the rate function. And here you have a kind of a picture of what we'll be discussing. So we want to describe the distribution. We do not have the exact expression of the distribution, but we have the exponential approximation, the large deviation principle, and then we have the rate function. So the rate function will give you the shape of the distribution up to exponential order. And it's always positive. In many cases, it will have one zero. And so you see that because it's always positive, then everything decays exponentially. But if it happens that there's one zero, then at that point, we don't have exponential decay of probability. So at that point, the, the, the probability will actually concentrate. So the zero gives you concentration points of the distribution. It gives you the points, the location at which the probability does not decay exponentially. And then everywhere else, you have basically the rate at which everything decays exponentially. Here I'm putting a kind of parabolic rate function, so that will imply Gaussian fluctuation, but the rate function can be very complicated. And then we'll see some examples of this. Um, it doesn't have even to be convex. So, but if you know the shape of the rate function, you have a pretty good idea of what's happening at the level of the distribution. So this is why we're actually gonna focus on this because all corrections will be also smaller than exponential. If you know the power of the exponential, you know that you don't have to deal with anything that will come in front of it, which is smaller than exponential. Okay, so the goals at this point that really that's what the theory is about is that for given processes or for given random variables, you want to show that you have the large deviation principle, and then you want to obtain the rate function. So you want to develop methods or ways to calculate that rate function for particular problems. So this is what we're going to do. So there are many different results in the theory. I'm not gonna go over all of them. I'll present the main one that we use 
for doing actual calculation, which is called the Gartner Ellis theorem. It's also the most important for making connections with physics um, because it has a link with Legendre transform. So the idea is that, okay, so we want to prove that a certain random variable, the distribution of that random variable has a large deviation principle. If I put the baby to sleep. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of looking directly at the distribution, we'll look at the Laplace transform or the Fourier transform. It's something we do often in physics. We have a kind of dual point. So this is what we're going to do here. So we have that random variable A of N, and we'll take an exponential expectation. So I'm using the the angular bracket here for the expectation. I'm also using a bit part of my soul for not writing the, the E that was mentioned last week. Um, so we take the log of this. So the exponential expectation is a generating function, right? It's a Laplace transform of the distribution. The log is the cumulant. And if you take the limit, we call this the scale cumulant generating function. So this is what we want to calculate. If we can calculate this, so K is now is the real parameter. If we can calculate this, and this is the principle, then we have exactly what we want. We know that the random variable has a large deviation principle, and the rate function will be given by the Legendre transform of the scale cumulative generating function. So this is a result that comes from Gartner 77. Actually, the version I'm putting this is Gartner's version, and then it is just enlarged this with more technical condition, but that's the that's the case. Now you probably have seen the Legendre transform in a form different from this. This is what we call the Legendre Pankel. Um, transform, but it's essentially a Legendre transform. So, because if you take the maximum of this, you'll take the derivative, and then you get the exact equations of the Legendre transform. So, of course, you want to calculate this lambda k, you not using the fact that you have an LDP, right? You don't have information about an, and this is possible, and then we'll see how we can do this. So, that's the basic result. If we can calculate that lambda k, can test that it's differentiable, then there's an LDP, and I have the rate function explicitly. What this shows too is that the rate function in this particular case, if we can apply that theorem, the, the rate function will be convex because the result of a Legendre transform is always a convex function. So this is actually something interesting that points to the fact to the to other results that should be there to get non-convex rate function if such functions are non-convex. Okay, so that's the one that we'll be using the most. And then it's quite easy to understand where it's coming from, and it's all about exponentials. So here I'm just deriving a kind of my own physicist understanding of where this is coming. You can go deeper into this, but suppose that you have an LDP and then you look at this expectation of the exponential, then this is the integral really over the values of the random variable with the exponential factor. So that's the Laplace transform, that's the generating function. And if you have the LDP, then this integral will be approximated to exponential order by putting the LDP now. But we also know something else. The, the integral of exponential factors is dominated by the largest exponential factor. That's called the Laplace approximation. So the dominant exponential order, the exponential is n times the max of this Ka minus i of a. So this means that if you look at the lambda k, the lambda k itself is the Legendre transform of the rate function. And so you need conditions to invert that Legendre transform, and then you get essentially to the gartner ellis condition. In order to invert the Legendre transform, you need to know that the function is strictly convex, and that's the differentiability. This kind of calculation was formalized by Varada in the 66, and that's really the, the beginning of the rigorous theory of large deviation. The definition of the large deviation principle comes from this paper, and Varada didn't really just look at this Laplace approximation. There's something deeper there, he generalized the notion of a Laplace approximation for any kind of random vectors in any dimension, including random functions and function space. So this is a, a nice extension of the Laplace approximation that justifies really um, this idea that integral of random objects, exponentials of random objects will be dominated uh, in the same Laplace way by the max. Okay. I'm just going to stop here to go back to Kramer and then look at an application of the gartner ellis theorem. So by looking at sample means, so sum of random variables that are identically distributed and independent, but they all have the same distribution. And according to gartner ellis what I should do is to calculate this lambda k. Now, if my a n is a sum of i i d random variables, this is very much simplified because 
the expectation of a product of random variables for independent random variable is the product of the expectation. And so if you take the log and then the limit, you see that you'll see that the limit disappears. So the lambda k for an IID sum is really just the log of the generating function of one random variable. So that's the cumulant of one random variable. And so we're back to Kramer. So in this case, the distribution, if this is differentiable, the distribution will be exponential and the rate function will be the Legendre transform of the cumulant function, just as Kramer actually found in 38. So if you take, um, as a particular case, a Gaussian distribution for the random variable, then you can calculate the lambda k. In this case, the lambda k is a parabola, it's differentiable. You take the Legendre transform, it's also a parabola. And what you get is, a rate function that's quadratic around the mean. So you have a rate function that's positive everywhere. It's got a zero at the mean, and that's because of the log large number. The most likely value of a sum of random variable is the mean of these random variables, the expectation. The rate function will tell you that everything concentrates exponentially around that mean. And so here I'm showing the distribution for different values of the sum. It's actually just a sketch because at 500, it will be so peak as not to be visible on, on, on the graph there, okay? So that's that's the Gaussian case with the parabolic rate function. What's interesting is that you can play the same game with a different distribution. For instance, take the exponential, you can calculate the lambda k, it's also differentiable in some domain, you can take the Legendre transform, and then you get the rate function specifically that's like this. And this one now is interesting because it's not Gaussian. It still has a zero at the mean, from the log large number, the typical, the most likely value of the sum will be the mean. So that's where you have concentration of probability, exponential concentration of probability. And then the rate function will tell you what's the exponentially unlikely way of having the fluctuations away from the mean. And then it looks parabolic around the zero. So you have Gaussian fluctuations there, but in the tails, it's not Gaussian. So it describes something which has non-Gaussian fluctuations. In particular, in the far tail, that's basically linear. So you have exponential large deviations for the large fluctuations, the large deviation. And then you have something also that's highly non-parabolic, close to zero, because you cannot have negative fluctuations. And so the fluctuations close to zero are really damped also, exponentially damped there. So again, the rate function here, the upshot is that the, the plot of the rate function or the knowledge of the rate function will really give you um, very precise information about the fluctuation of the, of the random variable. And not just precise, in a way, the more precise because you do this at the exponential scale. So any corrections will be sub-exponential. So you might want to try to get corrections to the exponential. It will be lots of work. Sometimes you can do this, but you're not getting much out of this because the exponential factor just dominates entity. Okay. There are other results to get uh, rate function. Here I'm presenting another one. I think I'm going to skip this one here. Um, this is just to show that the Gartner Elis theorem is not just the only result to get rate function. There are other ways to get uh, rate functions, in particular rate functions that um, uh, are not convex. Maybe actually I should stop here because that might be useful for Thursday. Um, we've heard this idea actually last week, this idea that you can look at fluctuations of the system and you can have something that behaves exponentially there. Then if you look at the level just a bit higher, the distribution will also behave exponentially. So you can derive large deviation approximation this way. So this is the idea. Suppose that you have a random variable, which is bn. You want to determine what's the distribution of bn, but you don't have bn itself, but you know that bn is given by as a function of another random variable, af. Moreover, you know that there's an LDP for AN, so you know the distribution for AN, and you know the rate function. I'm going to call this I of A. Automatically, this will imply that BN also has a large deviation principle. And this follows also from integral of exponentials and applying the Laplace approximation. So it will say that because BN is a function of AN, automatically it has an LDP, so the distribution of BN also inherits this exponential form, and the rate function for B is just a contraction of the rate function for A. Essentially, you have to imagine that the fluctu a given fluctuation B can come up from different values of the random variable A, and the probability for that fluctuation will come from the largest exponentially small probability for the different values of A leading to that B. Okay, so here you're taking the min of A, so you're looking at 
the largest probability of A that leads to a given value of B. And so that's the contraction principle. That's used a lot when you do hydrodynamic limits of um, stochastic field models or microscopic uh, interacting particles. And then you have a kind of density or current large deviation. So a kind of field large deviations and you want to lift this large deviation description to large deviations of observables of the underlying field. So I might discuss this on Thursday. So what you just said, I can see why you call it a contraction. But what's on the board, I don't see any reason for it to be called a contraction. It's a contraction in the sense that the, the mapping from A to B could be many to one. Oh, it could be. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. So and it isn't a contraction. If, it, if it's a if it's a one to one mapping, then there will be no minimum. You just say, well, there's only one value of A leading to a value of B. So I'm going to just take that value A as the fluctuation. But because in general, it could be a many to one mapping, the mathematicians decided to call this a contraction. You contract uh, uh, LDPs to one level down. And in fact, there's a kind of hierarchy of large deviation principles in mathematics that has names like level two, level one, level three, and they just higher levels that you can go down by contraction. It's not something I'm going to discuss, but we can discuss this after if you want. So technically, what do you do when you go to many to one? Many to one, you have to do the minimization. So many to one means that you have many values A such that F of A gives you B. So that means that for a given fluctuation, fluctuation B, there are many candidates of possible values of A that could have produced that fluctuation B. In fact, all of them could contribute in terms of probability but because the probability of all these candidate values are exponentially small, the small probability for B is determined only by the largest small probability for A. And so that's what the contraction says. It's a very simple idea. What's difficult in maths, as always, is to prove things. And so, <laughs> so, so this is what Varada did, and not just for real random variables or vector finite vector random variables. So he did this for also random functions. So very general kind of space and very general types of random variables. And you want to prove this kind of principle that holds it in a general way. So does this only work when F is independent of N? No, F can be also dependent on N, but there will be conditions here. In fact, here, I'm kind of implying that there are no conditions for this result to all, which is not true, of course. There are some conditions to all. And the one condition that's very important or was very important initially in the result is that you have to use random variables that are defined on compact. But that was kind of generalized later on. And then you have kind of a long list of contraction principles that are more and more generals, but more and more general, but with more and more technical conditions attached to them. Okay, but the idea is there. And again, the one thing that I, attracted me in the field in the first place was the, the very simple ideas involved here. We, we're only dealing with the exponential form and the fact that the integral of an exponential is exponential. The sum of a bunch of exponential is dominated by the exponential. And that's the underlying idea. There's no more to it. So you can always do a kind of back of the envelope calculation to test something. But again, if you start reading the maths, it's a different story altogether. But it's an ego uh, no, uh, multi-value no no there might be versions of i mean like, i can imagine if you look at different branches uh, yeah okay so these are the basic ideas exponential form for the distribution the fact that the exponential is the dominant part of the distribution the fact that when you have an exponential form for the distribution, it implies also an exponential form for generating function. And that's the connection with Gartner and it's, and that's the connection that was made formal and by Barrett in the first place. Here I'm showing two examples, the Gaussian example we've seen, but also now a non-Gaussian example. You can have a rate function like this that has some complicated form. It has a zero, so you have concentration, but it's a kind of metastable value where the probability will also be decaying exponentially, but not as fast as the neighboring values. And so this can describe something like phase transition and a D you C rate function like this in the context of phase transition. And I'll discuss this later. The other idea that's very important is the idea of typicality. So, and this is especially relevant for statistical physics is that we're dealing with state space that are huge. If you look at the microscopic configurations for a perfect gas or a gas or a system, you have in particle, you have an exponentially large uh, uh, microscopic space. But what this tells you is that 
In fact, most of the states are not important. Most of the states are typical. So if you plug them at random, you'll see that they have macro state values that are more or less the same. These are the typical configuration associated with typical values of observer. And then if you look at the whole state space, really most of it is a bunch of typical sequences for random variables or microscopic states for physical systems that will lead you to this concentration of probability. So I mentioned this, I'm just going to recap on this, the minimum of a rate function can do the typical values, the concentration values, and that's related to the love large number. In many cases around the minimum, you have a parabolic rate function, and that's related to Gaussian fluctuations of the central limit theorem. But the main point, again, is that rate functions can be complicated and non-parabolic, and this will describe non-Gaussian uh, fluctuations. Okay, so now I'll come back to physics. With the first application, I should check my time now, which is equilibrium statistical physics. So I'll go quickly on this because I'll just rephrase equilibrium statistical mechanics in the language of large deviation, and then we'll see how far that goes. Yes. So it's not important. Yes. So if, if the theory was only applicable to IID sums, it wouldn't be a theory. And I don't think people would have spent so much energy in making this a theory. So the important point is that these ideas are very general, and this will be the goal of the rest of the talk. And then what we'll see also on Wednesday. It's the fact that this arises in many situations, in many interesting situations. And then the interesting part that came in the 80s from Valadin was to show that this arises in the context of Markov processes, so beyond independence. And this is what I'll discuss on Wednesday. What I want to do now is to look at interacting, interacting particle systems in equilibrium systems where we don't have time. So we have n particles. We can describe them in terms of a microstate, microscopic state, will be the state of particle one, state of particle two, all the way to state of particle n. And then we need to describe what's the basic probability of these microscopic states. And then for us, this amounts to defining what the ensemble is. So the underlying this probability distribution for the microscopic configurations will be determined as to whether you have fixed energy, fixed temperature. And so you have to choose your favorite ensemble. Now, of course, the basic idea in statistical mechanics is that we're not looking at the microscopic configurations for the macro, the macro states, so some kind of uh, global um, uh, quantity like the energy magnetization, and then we want to calculate the distribution of this. We want to find a distribution. Out of the distribution, we want to find the typical values of the macro state. And then in the equilibrium context, the typical values are the equilibrium states. These are the states that will have exponential probability to arise. Any fluctuations, if you have an LVP, will have an exponentially small probability to, um, to arise around equilibrium. And then we have a limit here, which is a thermodynamic limit. The thermodynamic limit is interesting here because in physics, the thermodynamic limit is usually introduced by saying we don't want quantities that depend on the shape of objects or, or material. We want quantities, so for instance, like heat capacity or energy that will scale with the size of the system. So these quantities are extensive. So we have to take the thermodynamic, th thermodynamic limit as a convenience, a mathematical convenience to make all quantities shape independent. And then we divide also by n to have intensive quantities that will be true for all material in terms of, of size and mass and so on. But from a large deviation point of view, we anticipate that we need a thermodynamic limit because we're going to extract the exponential form of the distribution. And so we need that limit just to get the rate function. And so this is what we get. So here I'm showing two situations. If you look at the microcanonical ensemble, then what you're doing is that you're just saying that the, the probability of a configuration is the same for all configurations having the same energy. That's the microcanonical ensemble. If you look at the probability distribution for the observable, if you follow Einstein, then this should be the exponential of an entropy function. But we know that the entropy scales like the size of the system by extensivity. So we get that the distribution actually scales exponentially with n. And this is a large deviation principle. This is the approximation that you get from large deviation theory. So instead of starting from Einstein, now you can start from the maths to actually derive this as a derived result um, coming from a model. Yes, Kieran. Small u here will be like, this is your control parameter for the ensemble. You fix the energy, 
And so everything now will be indexed by you because it's your parameter. If you change you, yeah, that will be the other case. If you look at the canonical instead, then the parameter is the temperature. So then the distribution now is parameterized by temperature or inverse temperature. And now if you follow Landau, the probability should go like the free energy, exponential of the free energy. Free energy also is extensive with the size of the system. So you also get the LDP. So the probability should go down exponentially with the size of the system, but you can also get this mathematically from the theory, from the activation theory. So here I'm just making a connection again from the physics or what was understood already in terms of probability, but with the mathematical theory where you can use Gartner alias to derive these rate function. And it is something that I got introduced to the subject by using the large deviation connection to calculate rate functions and entropy functions for actual physical systems, long range interacting systems. Yes. So, so yeah. Yeah. Last question. Well, this is very classical, Yes, yes. Some, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but there've been some applications. I'll come to this. Okay, so so here we have the exponential concentration. So we have this exponential typicality again, and this is something that we understand quite a lot in physics. The fact that objects are stable because although we have fluctuations, the fluctuations are very unlikely. This is now more quantitative because we say that the fluctuations are exponentially unlikely. And as, as we, we knew before in the theory, the equilibrium states will be the typical values, and these will minimize the rate function. So if I minimize the rate function from the point of view of entropy and maximize the entropy, if I minimize the rate function on the canonical side, I'll be minimizing the free energy. And it's something that was also known way before the event of large deviation. But now these results are couched in the language of large deviation. So this is an example where you look at, say, a perfect gas. You look at the different velocities of the particle. You can count the number of particles that have a given velocity. So this is a bit like Boltzmann application, but, but you look at the velocity instead of just the energy level of each of the particle. The histogram of the velocity is a random object. If I redo a simulation or an experiment and I can actually find a full histogram of velocity, I'll get different uh, velocity histogram. They can calculate what's the probability of having a given velocity histogram. It follows a large deviation principle. What's the most likely histogram to find? It's the both. It's the Maxwell distribution of velocity. Okay. So if you do measurements and you plot the histogram of all the velocities that you tag or label, then the most likely histogram that you'll see, which is exponentially likely compared to all other, will be the Maxwell distribution. And so in the space of all velocity distribution, the Maxwell one is the typical one. It, it just occupies all the space of possible microstates. This is also in a way, Sanov's result and in, in Boltzmann results. There's a further connection. You can go deeper into thermodynamics because you can also look at the system and say, how many configurations just like Einstein do I have for a fixed energy? We know this goes exponentially. So this is kind of a large deviation principle, not for a probability, but for a density of state. I could turn it into a probability just by intruding, introducing probabilities, but I don't have to. Then I can play the same game. Can I apply Gartner-Ellis in this case? Yes, I can. So the entropy, I should be able to express it as a Legendre transform of some scale term generating function. What is the scale term generating function in this case? Well, it's the free energy. It's exactly the scale to generating function here, I'm just writing with different symbol. It's the generating function of the density of state. So the generating function is the partition function. And if I take the log and the limit, I get the free energy. And so we get to the result that the entropy, if the free energy is differentiable, is the Legendre transform of the free energy. This for me was kind of the, the result that really got me into the, the theory. I got interested because I remember having this question as a undergraduate student in thermodynamics, why do we have the Legendre transform in thermodynamics? And the answer was, well, it's just physics. And that's physics. It has to be there. So then you're asking why, why, why? Professor says it's enough whys now, <laughs> it's just physics. But then I got the answer there. The reason why we have the Legendre transform is because of the Laplace approximation, the Laplace principle saying that integrals of exponentials are exponentials. And so you have that Legendre connection. And the Legendre connection will come again in different contexts exactly for the same reason. So that this is just a kind of the view of how you can apply large deviations in equilibrium statistical mechanics. And you can go deeper into this 
the first physicist, mathematical physicist who actually really was there to see that there was a connection from mass, like knowing the mass of large deviations and starting to apply this in physics was Oscar Lanford in the 70s and then Ellis in the 80s. And then there were more works um, really on this explicit connection between large deviations and statistical physics. And another important one came from John Lewis and from Ireland. And then there are many more, including quantum systems. So I also have more references for you, Kiran, if you're interested. Um, so quantum spin systems, but also now quantum communication channels and things. Lots of work also in spin glasses and showing again that you have this large deviation structure, microscopic description, macro, macro state, distribution of macro state, exponential form of the distribution and so on, and everything being describable in terms of, of rate function. Okay, so I'm close to finishing now. I just want now to kind of lay the path for what we'll be doing on Wednesday and where you can take this beyond equilibrium system. So I assume that for most of you, the interest will be on non-equilibrium system. And here the idea is that you have a stochastic process. So you have already your model. So I live on this side. I assume the model is given already. Many of you actually are working on determining what the model is. And I have huge respect for that. And I fully have even more respect for that side when you get your hands dirty and come up with the, with the data. Um, but what I'll be dis discussing on, on Wednesday is a kind of the simplest way to teach the subject with very simple Markov processes. But so you have a stochastic process, it could be one or many particles, something that's driven by external forces or, or uh, boundary reservoirs. Now it's all dynamical. So you have stochastic path for the evolution of your system, but you have that same idea that you have a dynamical description, but you're also interested in looking at observables. So it could be integrated current, it could be densities of particles. So you can have a system of particles like this with hot and cold reservoir. You have fluctuations of the transport in between. So you have fluctuating currents, fluctuating density, and you want to describe the probability distributions of these observables. So the game here is the same. The added difficulty is that you have time in the picture. So you want to find the, the distribution. The typical values now will be called stationary states. You're expecting large deviation principles. You're going to have an exponential distribution describing the fluctuations. And now you have many possible limits at hand because you can have a many non many particle non-equilibrium systems. So you can have a kind of thermodynamic limit where you have infinitely many part particles. You can take a long time limit, which is what I'll be discussing on Wednesday. And you can also take another kind of scaling limit where the noise, the noise goes to zero. And this is also a limit that's relevant for hydrodynamic limits. So fluctuation, uh, fluctuating field here. Yes. Uh, are there cases where the order of limits matter? Yeah. Um, so there are cases where you have these multiple limits. The order of the limits will matter. You get different behaviors in the different orders and so on. And you can get very technical and mathematical on this. Yes. So everything depends on this game of the one over n normalization and the reasonable state. So you have normal extent of the 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 the normal extent of 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 the the probability so in math what they write is that you're going to have another scaling factor here with the rate function i away and then this has to increase with n it doesn't have to be n it could be something else so you put that one where n square square root of n yes yes so that that's described in the theory but for most of the applications that we see in physics it's actually linear because of extensivity that's not true, actually. It's not always true, no. Look at the energy or something. KPZ, yes, 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 yes. I've worked on this myself. I'm quite interested to see where it kind of breaks down. But there's not a separate theory for this. The theory itself is defined from the start with assuming that you could have a different behavior from the start. Okay, so that's something I, I'll be describing on Wednesday. And then something I might describe on Thursday is another limit, if that's the low noise limit. So this is a different large deviation theory that was developed in the 70s on the math side. But if you're a physicist if, and you read this, there's strong hints of Anzager there. Uh, so this is another physics maths 
connection, disconnection, and some history that could be done as a project. So here you're looking at stochastic differential equations that are perturbed by a small noise. And then there's also exponential concentration here. The exponential concentration is on the fact that as the noise goes to zero, all paths need to concentrate or collapse on the deterministic trajectory. So when the noise is small, then everything tends to concentrate on the deterministic trajectory. And so you have exponential large deviation principles, but now you divide by the noise amplitude, the epsilon there, epsilon goes to zero. So you have your large parameter for the large deviation um, uh, distribution. And then if you have this kind of description, then all probabilities derived from the from this will also have the exponential form. And this is the basis, for instance, of the Kramer's escape problem or the Arrhenius law, the fact that if you have a system in a kind of metable stable state, then it's exponentially unlikely with the temperature or the inverse temperature to escape. And then the probability will be determined by the free energy difference, which in this case is kind of your, your rate function. So this is used a lot now in chemistry to look at conformal changes in proteins, thermal activation, and how you how a protein can go from one configuration to another by a sequence of very specific states that we call the instanton or the transition paths. So I might describe this on Thursday if this is you if you're interested on this. I'll give you the choice in the survey on Wednesday. And then the one thing I'll describe on Wednesday is the long time limit for Markov processes. So here we have a Markov process. The observable is integrated in time, and then we want to get the distribution of the observable. And now the large deviation principle is expressed in the scaling limit where t goes to infinity, so the observation time is long. And then we have that large deviation principle. And in this case, the rate function is connected to the generator spectral properties of the Markov process. So there, there are nice connections with spectral theory in this case. And this is what I'll discuss. For the physics, this is related to stochastic thermodynamics because you can imagine kind of run in particle experiment where you can measure work or heat exchange. And so you can define thermodynamic like quantities for stochastic processes and you want to describe the distribution. It's also relevant for free energy estimation. If for an equilibrium system, there are ways to estimate free energy differences by doing work experiments in time. And so this is related to work distribution. And there are many more connections and statistics and simulation. If you do simulation, chances are everything that you estimate in a simulation is a time average. So the distribution will also be exponential. And one I, I'm pretty sure I won't describe is microscopic fluctuation theory. So this is, this is the ultimate technical boundary or region in large deviation theory. You need very expert people like Kiran to work on this mathematically. Now you have many particles evolving in time. You want to describe the whole dynamics, but also in a field way. So you, you, you do um, hydrodynamic limits. So you describe the particle systems in terms of fields and densities. And, but you want to retain a bit of the noise in there in order to get large deviations of the current and the densities. And so here you're gonna have a microscopic description which via a hydrodynamic limit will be transformed into a noisy uh, field theory that will describe the system at large scale. And then you have also large deviations on that side. This is actually connected to the small noise limit um, and then the, the, the thing that I just described. Before. So these are possible ways to work on this from the physics point of view in many applications. There are more. Um, here, I'm just putting some pictures. I have no intention of describing uh, these, but it's, it's quite an active field. There's some work also in active matter um, with Mike's group of describing fluctuations in active matter using activation technique. Also, Rob Jack. Um, there's lots of work also on the simulation side because as always in physics, there's so much you can calculate and then um, you want to go beyond this. So you need simulation, but the problem of simulating rare events is that they're exponentially unlikely. So if you do straight Monte Carlo simulation, you're not gonna see them. So there's lots of work in designing kind of reweighting technique or, or, or biasing technique in order to do efficient simulations of rare events. And it's actually what I'm working mostly on these days. Okay, so I'll finish. We had just a kind of dictionary table, a kind of language table of the connections that we've seen and something to take you further on. So this connection with random variable, microscopic configurations, ensemble and stochastic systems, you can use just different words to describe the same thing in, in, in the kind of level, the mathematical level that you want to take. What is considered an equilibrium state for physicists, for a mathematician, will be just a typical value, a most probable value. 
fluctuations are a rare event. And the connection for us that's interesting is this idea that entropy functions are in fact rate functions mathematically, and free energy functions are cumulative functions or scale to generative functions. And so this is useful in terms of mathematics. It's not just to translate what we already know in physics. If you can make a connection with physics, then you have the conditions for actually deriving things. And then um, we have more techniques, in fact, to, to derive functions or calculate functions like entropy, free energy, using mathematical method that weren't, we weren't aware of before knowing about that connection. So I see this as a kind of good language for um, speaking to mathematicians, but also a kind of unified language for statistical physics, because the structure we see for equilibrium is the same structure that we see for non-equilibrium, and the same structure that we see also for the fluctuation theory. Good, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the last one. Yeah. Okay. So, um, suppose I've got a system where obviously there is a global free energy minimum, and that scales to the number of uh, different partners. But I also have many uh, next to the And that is probably maybe not as the, the sub scale with the particle number, but maybe some sort of some number. No. Just like spin glasses, or yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so is is there a, is there a possibility of you know applying this kind of theory, generalizing these ideas there? Then, then? Yeah. Um, so there's been some work from Giorgio Carisi and then some students. Even I, I think many of the concepts that people were using in spin glass theory actually are very reminiscent of large deviations and might have been, I mean, are large deviation tools, but discovered independently in that context, but. The notion of entropy, so the entropy of the landscape, but also the distributions of the, the macrostates is also will have an exponential form. In this case, then it's it's made more complicated by the fact that the rate function itself or the, the free energy landscape will, is very complicated. It's very complex. You have many metastable states and sometimes an extensive number of metastable states with the size of the system. And that's the that's the real complexity of spin glasses. But the ideas are, are there too. Other questions? Yes, yeah, we come back to the first question. Yeah. So, uh, um, so, of course, the uh, large division is, is about a basic rare event, right? Yeah. So we take a large and then we just use it in small probability, which doesn't sound so interesting. Yeah. 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 But, but in My mom says, yeah, you can make it of some dynamics. Yeah. So we are not really caring about the very event, right? So maybe as the equilibrium statistical mechanics may be formulated in the language of deviation, but we are not really caring about the very event. I think the reason is that uh, so this kind of parameter, the lambda, uh, for general genetic function may be taken to be more physical one in equilibrium statistical mechanics. Temperature or oh, yeah, yeah. So then, so by changing such parameters, yeah. we can realize such a very event. That's a most probable state. Yeah, and it's a very good comment. So, the, <laughs> so of course, the structure of the for equilibrium statistical mechanics specifically is that we have that exponential dominance of the equilibrium state. So, if you want to measure fluctuation, either you're very patient or you have any unlimited resources, or you go to smaller system where the fluctuations will be more observable. But that that's a good point. Is that by changing the temperature, you you you'll change the equilibrium state. And then there's a nice structure, which I'm not describing here, but the equilibrium state that you see for a given temperature is actually the, the fluctuating state for another temperature, right? Yeah. And, and this is actually used to calculate entropy. When you calculate entropy by thermodynamic integration with, by doing heat capacity measurements, you're actually using this very connection. You're changing temperature, and then you're visiting a sequence of equilibrium states that are actually rare values for other temperatures. This is used in simulations also. Yeah, in mm -hmm. that sense, uh, you know, when we are talking about uh, equilibrium static physics, then even though we are, uh, we may be using large division theory, but uh, we don't really, we are not really thinking about considering variables. But for other systems, including more equilibrium static physics program, we are really working on some variables, right? Yeah. But I would claim that rare events also important yeah. for equilibrium stat mech. If you look at metastability and first mm -hmm. order transition, mm -hmm. the bi stability or the 
the transition from metastable to stable will be triggered by noise. And so this is an exponentially unlikely event. Mm -hmm. And then the notion of also of exponentially unlikely is a, is a question of scale. In chemistry, for instance, when you look at change in proteins, the, the rare events are rare events at the level of the simulation time. So if you simulate at 10 to the minus six seconds, the rare events actually will arise at 10 to the minus three. So if it takes two weeks to simulate, then you're gonna see one rare event every two mm -hmm. weeks. So that's a rare event. But on the human observation scale at the second, like time scale of seconds, you see these rare events all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of scale. And I haven't really discussed this point, but what is rare? When you say rare event, you have to you have to specify the scale mm -hmm. also. Okay. So in such a sense, uh, large deviation for you know, no increment system of your importance to be Yeah, I think so. Thank you. So just a comment. Uh, in problem material, the statistical kind of function problem, there is a whole stuff here which tries to uh, derive a statistic ensemble or something. I think it's like another example okay. of each of the problems. So this one is based on this. So following, following, uh, those steps to get into print and check it out. I think it's something quite related. Okay, I can have a bit of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Other questions or comments? So, if you know, we are so very much on this one, so we will speak to this the one around the same time. Yeah, so the mask effect, I've already mentioned that uh, uh, it's valid and it's a very issue that we can also go from the big function. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Which, uh, for yeah. So my question is, what is known in the map about necessary information? There's lots of work. Yeah. So this is this is what I was doing for my PhD actually. So equivalence of ensemble. And so basically this differentiability condition in the Gartner alias means that you have the absence of phase transition. For thermodynamics in order to be able to connect free energy and entropy and the point is that if you really look at systems entropy by definition is not necessarily concave or convex depending on which sign you want to put it and so there, there's something fundamental in breaking the Legendre transform so the Legendre transform is not always true between entropy and free energy and there are systems in fact that have non-convex entropies. And so in this case, you need something else to get them. It's not given by Legendre transform. So there's, there's lots of work on these conditions, how you can, conditions to make sure that there's a Legendre transform in, in either side. We can discuss that. Other questions? Okay. okay, we'll look uh, let's thank two again. Okay.